On behalf of the Socratic Club, I would like to welcome you to our second debate of the academic year. I would like to ask you all to please respect our speakers and your fellow audience members by abstaining from conversation <coughs> during the debate. There will be a question and answer period following the debate, at which time we encourage you to ask all of your questions. The Socratic Club was founded by C.S. Lewis in 1941 at Oxford University to explore the intersections of Christianity, contemporary science, and culture. We continue this tradition in honor of his commitment to the frank and open discussion of beliefs. Tonight's debate will focus not on death, but on dying. The debaters will attempt to answer the question, is there a good way to die? What are the moral implications of euthanasia? And is it our right to choose when and how we die? These questions and our debaters' attempts at answering them are sure to provide a difficult, yet intellectually stimulating debate for tonight. Let me say no more than to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Jerome Murnau. Dr. Murnau is director of the Northwest Center for Bioethics in Portland, where he has served for the last 12 years addressing issues such as euthanasia, assisted suicide, advanced directives, and conscientious objection. In 2008 to 2009, he was an Erasmus Mundus scholar in bioethics at the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, as part of an international team that studied the place of conscientious objection to euthanasia among healthcare professionals. Dr. Wernow is a licensed pharmacist in Oregon, as well as lead pastor of Grace Point Fellowship in Camas, Washington. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wernow. I will need a microphone, I believe. Maybe not, probably. Not that one. I begin my address this evening from a very deep philosophical and theological film called What About Bob? <laughs> Siggy makes the statement, I'm going to die, you're going to die, and there is nothing that we can do about it. What could be worse? Bill Murray says, Tourette's. I introduce that because I, I am mildly afflicted with Tourette's, so I hope you will excuse my little twitches here and a few little uh, grimaces and whatever. It's not as bad as Bill Murray poses it to be. <laughs> well, at least my affliction may be yours by the end of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Euthanasia, a good death? Sick at not, yes or no? Oh, yes, to your surprise, you heard me well. However, care must be taken in what you heard. For I am conflicted on this wage due to us all, common to us all, common to you, common to me, common to Dr. Roberts. I have been stunned with the face of hard deaths that seemed good and soft deaths that seemed very bad. My ultimate point this evening is this. The good of a good death lies not in the hardness or softness of passing, but rather in the presence of eternal life that precludes a second death. Please permit me to repeat myself. The good of a good death lies not in the hardness or softness of passing, but rather in the presence of eternal life that precludes a second death. By second death, I mean the nine burning knowledge of eternal separation from all fulfillment of what a resurrected individual was created to actualize. It is a separation from the reflection of God's uh, image by adamant individual choice. 
So I invite you into the deepest reflections of my soul that you may understand what has brought me to my ultimate answer to the question, euthanasia, a good death? And I bring you there from my reflection entitled, Euthanasia, Facing, Facing a Good in Search of a Story. I have three clarifications that I would like to lay before you as I proceed. First, uh, Professor Ferngren asked me to stand out of my area, which I'm usually, uh, I usually move in, that's politics and social policy. So I will not be addressing euthanasia from that perspective. I won't be doing that. He asked me, and I quote, to defend the pro-life position not from the point of view of politics or social policy, but from a the Christian idea of respect for life, unquote. Here I wish to be very clear at the outset. I consider a radical, vitalist, sanctity of life approach, that is, one that insists on, to use Heideggerian terms, one that exalts biological substance of physical life with all effort and all cost, idolatrous. I have never, nor do I support that position. When disease is irreversible, irreparable, and death is imminent, the community is called to face the dying one as worthy of agapeic loving care. And second clarification, locating the meaning of the term euthanasia. I recognize the late modern construct of the notion of euthanasia. And I recognize as the application of medical technology to the termination of human life for the purposes of amelioration of suffering. And I also recognize that this construct has grounding in a strand of traditions throughout antiquity. I call it to for a Judeo-Christian Hippocratic construct as well of the term of euthanasia. It's one that is rooted in a different strand of tradition in antiquity and dominate in Western thought through the early 20th century. Here, euthanasia means a calm and easy death, usually associated with palliative care. <clears throat> Neither construction, in my opinion, necessitates the attribute that death being good. Neither construction, in my opinion, necessitates the attribute of that death being good. So what you're hearing me is nuance the notion from a, what it is purported, fundamentalist evangelical position, and also you're hearing me in opposition to the medicalization of euthanasia. I proceed with the third clarification. My approach if you're unfamiliar familiar with this from continental thought, it's a narrative approach. So I'll let lay out my method so you understand how I'm, how I'm going and where I'm going. I will answer the question of the goodness of death by posing three questions, then presenting three pairs of stories that paint word pictures that color good. Each question and each beginning story comes from the book of books par excellence, a quote from Emmanuel Levinas. And the second story will come to humanize the stories from the Book of Books. The flow of thought faces a good death from stories of the subject facing their death, one. From onlookers who face the others who are dying, two. And finally, from stories that face God in the face of the dying, one. For those of you who are philosophically minded, the approach is a synthesis of Martin Luther's I am thou, Emmanuel Levinas is the face of the other, and finally Paul de Coeur and the narration of story. Let's cut to the chase and go to the first story. Facing, putting a face on, a good death is final witness. The first question arises in the context of a letter to the community of faith in Philippi, purportedly by the Apostle Paul. He's in prison facing the angst of being beheaded for his Christian witness during the Neronian persecution of Christians. The apostle lauds the surpassing reward that comes after death, that is, the fullness of perfected life of Christ. Putting it in investment terms, Paul estimates that his eternal reward far exceeds his earthly life that he's invested in living for Christ, and even far exceeding the principle on that life. This leaves Paul conflicted, even ideating suicide as the New Testament professor and scholar John Dennis once opined. The question is this, what shall I choose? And by the way, the first two stories 
it, that would be directed for those in the Christian community. And what you get to do if you're not in that community is you get to get inside my head for a while. Because it might be a very strange place to walk around. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it lets you get inside maybe once if you haven't heard it. So you get to get inside in the head and take a look at how some Christians view it. The final story, I would say, is broad and universal. So in this first story, I'm looking at what Paul said. He said, what shall I choose? To Paul, a death is really good event due to the eternal fulfillment in the afterlife. So why not choose just to end it now? His answer is that good is in a good death is being there for the other. The other being perhaps the church community or those without outside contours of that community. That they may progress in the same spiritually transformed influence that empowered him to make that decision. To make the decision not in a selfish manner, but in a manner outside himself for the service of community until his life is poured out and empty. He eventually experienced that when the Roman authorities severed his head and his lifeblood bled out. You may be thinking to yourself, well, that's nice, Jerome boy, but how is this not just some distant ideation from some dead guy's letter? Well, I bring a second story to that one. His name was Errol, a beloved pastor of a church that he helped found that grew 40-fold in 16 years. He was soft-spoken, good-looking, great condition, except he was losing his ability to hold his pen, then to turn his ignition key, and then, and then, and then, until the ALS, that's the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, that was diagnosed, moved up his arm, down his other arm, down his leg, until he was immobilized in his motorized chair, and then moved to the place where he had a difficult time in swallowing his any kind of food into him, thick thick the liquid, and then <clears throat> moving to air hunger, as he was having a difficult time breathing, suffocating on his own saliva. Eight months prior to his death, Errol quietly filmed a funeral clip before Gordon's tomb, the supposed burial place from whence Christ was raised, a filming that was to be used as his final testimony at his memorial service. What Errol, um, what Errol chose was to live in an ever-diminishing state of quantitative quality of life that he might be a witness in transformational sanctity of life, example, model, and that ended with opiates and hospice care to take away the fact and the feeling that he was suffocating to death on his own mucus. As a spiritual brother once said to him during his angst, you showed your congregation how to live well, now show them how to die well. Experiencing the power of the spirit that was said to have raised Jesus, Carol did just that. Errol's answer to the question, good is in a good death, was being there for the others that they may progress in the same spiritually transformed eternal life that empowered Errol until his physical life was poured out and empty. Facing a good death for the other. This, that was the subject. Now, this is the other looking at the dying one. Our second question arises from Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. It is not the obvious question of who was the neighbor to the half-dead man, rather as the opening question, what must I do to inherit a turtle life? Facing the dying other entails the story of sin's victim beaten, nearly dead, naked, by some robbers as he passed, passed by by the supposedly religious group, and aided by a race considered unclean by proper religious society. It's a story that transcends the hardness of religion and the self-absorption of religion to transformation of redemption. And for those of you who don't know account of the Good Samaritan, I'll just lay it out quickly. I don't have a long time to uh, lay the synoptic out, but it goes like this. People are going to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, to have their Passover feast. <coughs> On the way, the, um, the man who was robbed, was, he was beaten by robbers and left for dead on the side of the road. You had two religious pass him and look, but they did not want to touch because that would make them unclean for the celebration. Hardness of religion. 